<laughs> amen, yes. Can I get an amen? All right. Cool. Well, we're starting a new sermon series this morning, and by the way, we're in John chapter 3. So if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and start turning there, or your Bible app, turn to John chapter 3. And as we're doing that, I want to remind us of, of a really cool and key one of my favorite passages of scripture, actually, in the book of Psalms, the largest chapter in all of the Bible, Psalms chapter 119, verse 105 says this, your word is a lamp, say lamp, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. I'm so grateful that in the times that we're living, uh, we don't have to um, fret or worry, uh, but that what increases, and I, 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 we just got a glimpse of that during our worship and song, and just gathering together as a body of believers, and uh, in Jesus' name, to to know that for such a time as this, uh, God in His providence and would in fact ordain this time for this moment that we're all alive, and we get to not only see the kingdom of God, but participate and walk in the work of the kingdom of God. And so uh, thankful that in this season, uh, now and forevermore, that the light of Christ is in us, the word of God being a lamp to guide our feet, to provide light for our path, and that's what we're going to do now as we open his word. Pray with me. Father, we thank you. Uh, for literally bringing us all together today. I know, Lord, that today uh, it is not by accident for all who are here in the Wilton Community Center. You have ordained this time. You have, uh, for such a time as this, gathered and brought each of us together. And for those that are online, thank you for connecting them here. Father, we pray that your word would illuminate and show us our lives as it is now. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that we can come to you as we are, and your love sustains us. Your grace is sufficient. We thank you for that, and we pray, Lord, that uh, your word would change us. We pray, Holy Spirit, from the inside out, would you illuminate the things that we need to bring to the table so that we may be like you. Father, get me out of the way today. And may your spirit change us from the inside out in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. So this new series that we're titling uh, Light Versus Darkness. And the byline is this, the war among us. Now don't tune out. Don't tune out when I say that. The war among us. And uh, I don't, I, I think, I just think more and more as the times that we're living, e even those that, that don't know God, uh, truthfully, are wondering and asking some, I would say, some good questions these days. There's something happening. There's something going on. I mean, this is the regular conversation, the regular talk uh, around wherever we go. And uh, when I have some conversation with some of you folks uh, some of the conversations that, uh, you know, you've been praying for family members and for neighbors and for your own kids um, to, to be drawn to the love of Christ. And, and it usually, what's amazing was, is it usually starts with questions. And, and, uh, and so today there are a, a number of questions in John chapter 3 that we're going to investigate and look at and, uh, and also ask the Lord to meet us where we're at, even in the questions that we may have. But it's light versus darkness, the war among us. And tru truthfully, the Holy Spirit has been stirring my heart uh, these days for some time now regarding this battle that we call spiritual warfare. Say spiritual warfare. But more specifically, what Jesus often describes this war with a simple but pointed metaphor, light versus darkness. This battle, this war, this fight of light versus darkness. And because we are uh, interactive and we love to interact uh, with one another, even those that are tuned in, you can do so on the comments. Uh, but I want to take an opinion poll, okay? So help me in this opinion 
poll. And the question in this poll is this, who's winning today, light or darkness? And so we want to take an opinion, we want to take a survey. Uh, how many of you would say who's winning today is those in the light? Okay, a few of us, okay. I'd say maybe 10%. All right, and then the, the next one then with this question, this p uh, opinion poll, is this, who's winning today? How many would say it's darkness? Okay, all right, maybe 15%. Some of you didn't vote. <laughs> so we're going to redo this. <laughs> we'll be here all day. <laughs> all right, so opinion poll. You can't, you have to cast your vote. All right, all right. Here it is. Who's winning today? How many of you say is light? The light. Okay. And I'll, I'll describe a little bit more about that as we, as we go on. Okay. A little bit more. Say again. It's already won. Ooh. Hey. Preach it, sister. <laughs> Woo. Amen. Uh, and that's it. That's the message in Jesus' name. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and go right to communion. Speaking of that, communion, by the way, is uh, t we're doing communion after uh, towards the end of my message. So if you've not gotten your communion cup, and your kit, as we call it, uh, we're going to do that at the end. And also those who are tuned in, you can grab those elements. Uh, how many of you would say that who's winning today is darkness? Okay, all right. A little bit more than the first time. Okay. So we have, I would say, maybe 70-30 uh, that light is winning. Yeah. The war among us is a spiritual one. It does feel like that there is an increase of evil, uh, what I would call intensified darkness in the atmosphere these days. As well, I do feel, I sense, and many other people who I've, who I've talked to as well feel this too, is that these days we are feeling and sensing and seeing an increase of what we would call good, the light of heaven, that's illuminating in the atmosphere today. Uh, I, I said this way, I've said this a few times, and I think it's appropriate to say it this way, uh, that, that as dark gets darker, this gives way for light to shine brighter. And so really, the question at hand today as we open John chapter 3, as this slide says, light and dark, the war among us, everyone has to choose. This is the choice today and beyond light or darkness. And so I want to set the stage of our text today. In John 3, Jesus is conversing. He's discussing and talking with an educated Jewish ruler by the name of Nicodemus. And for the sake of this man, Nicodemus, we'll call him today Nicky. This is Nicky, all right? Now, the discussion is centered around the spiritual truth of new birth, the reality of what is called being born again. Now, this confuses Nicky because he's thinking only physical, and he asks this question, how can an old man re-enter his mother's womb and be born again? Now, who isn't being sarcastic in asking that? He was genuine and really curious. What do you mean by this being born again, this spiritual rebirth? And so Jesus further explains and describes the truth and reality of spiritual rebirth in John chapter 3, and we're going to pick it up in verse 10. And Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things? I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen. Now, let me just pause there and say this, that when Jesus is saying, we tell you what we know, it could refer to Jesus, John the Baptist, the Old Testament prophets, and his disciples, or it could mean, as Jesus is referring to a collective, we tell you what we know, it could be the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So with that, verse 11, I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony, verse 12. 
But if you do not believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Verse 16, a familiar verse. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I do believe that verse 16 and 17 do in fact coincide and go together. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word today. I wonder as we look at this story, this account, this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, I wonder if Nicodemus didn't comprehend what Jesus was talking about out of pure ignorance, he just didn't know, or if it was just simply impossible for him to get it because of what 2 Corinthians 4.4 says, and it says this, Satan, who is the God, by the way, that's little g, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. The title of my message this morning is Blinded by the Light. Blinded by the Light. Now, for some of you, you're already singing this song in your mind. Blinded by the light. Whoa. All right, some of the young people are like, what? What's that song? This song goes all the way back to the 70s. It was written, by the way, by... Bruce Springsteen, and made popular by Manfred Mann's Earth Band. What kind of band name is that? Manfred Mann's Earth Band. 70s, blinded by the light. Essentially, Jesus was showing Nicodemus that he's caught. He's literally in this middle ground He's caught in the middle of a battle, a clash, a fight between light and darkness. And more specifically, Nicodemus is literally shown the light. But because of his preference of darkness, his mind and heart are blinded by what? The truth, blinded by Jesus. The light, Christ, Messiah, has come, but people prefer darkness. Now, Jesus' public teaching ministry of the kingdom of God often bothered and so frustrated people. Why? Because uh, his teaching of truth left them with this obvious choice. It was an obvious choice as Jesus was bringing the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is near. Actually, the kingdom of God is here, he would often say, referring to himself. And the choice was this, and is this even today, be healed, be saved from your spiritual blindness, or stay spiritually blind. This obvious choice, as he's 
sharing that he is God, he has come, he is, the kingdom of God is here. This battle of light versus darkness, what will you choose and who do you choose? This morning I want to shed light on light. So listen, nobody no longer has to be or stay confused, lost, or blind. With that, here's the first point. It's this. The light leads to intimacy. Say intimacy. The light leads to intimacy. Verse 18, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact, that God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness, not liked, not preferred, but loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. Now the Bible makes it abundantly clear, without mincing any words, that you are either A, one who believes and is saved, or B, one who does not believe and is condemned. The one who believes does not come into judgment, but has literally passed out of death into life. However, the one who does not believe is condemned and will be judged. And salvation depends entirely upon one's relationship to Christ, either faith in him or rejection of him. And the Bible makes it clear that the outcome is non-negotiable. Light versus darkness. It's interesting that the word light appears over 200 times in the Old and New Testament. There are three distinct aspects of light. The first one being what we could call the light of God, also referred to as Genesis light. And this is Genesis light is the illumination at creation on that first day when literally formlessness and emptiness gave way to form and fullness, the light of God. The other two aspects of light is the light of Christ and man's role, your role, my role as uh, representatives, as literally ambassadors of light. Light is the symbol of salvation and and spiritual growth and discernment and, don't miss it, and relationship. The light of Christ represents intimacy in Christ with Christ. Perfect relationship. I'm saying perfect relationship with Christ, which is a life forgiven, a life restored, saved, delivered from sin and death is made possible because of the work of Christ. And when Jesus said from the cross, it is finished, the temple curtain, we just sang about it this morning, the temple curtain literally ripped from top to bottom. And what that meant or what that means even today is this curtain, the temple curtain ripping from top to bottom as Jesus said, it is finished. This gave you, this continues to give you and me full access, say full access, full and complete access to the open door that is the light of Christ. Perfect relationship with the living God. Have you ever just taken a step back and considered that? Maybe it's time to consider and, and lean in to the truth and the reality that what Jesus did on the cross the finished work of your sin and my sin, past, present, and future, gave you and me access of perfect relationship with the living God. I don't, I don't know about you. It's easy to get distract, distracted. It's easy to take our, our eyes in the inheritance as followers of Jesus that you have been granted, you have been given full access to a perfect relationship with the living God. Uh, what does this do for you? Uh, leaves me often speechless. Uh, it, it, I'll say it this way. It gives a way out to the worry that we would tend to wear 
instead worship, from worry to worship, to say, God, thank you that you did this for me so that I may have perfect, perfect, complete relationship with you. Let me ask you this question. Have you opened that door? Did you open that door, but for some reason not walk towards the light into the light? Has the concerns and the temptations and, and the trials and tribulations of this world dim the light that you once had? Let me ask this. Has the enemy stolen and just about killed your light? Questions, I believe, to consider this morning and ask the living God to love us right where we're at. Now, I'm going to give a little illustration. Hopefully, this makes the point. This over here is a light bulb. Say light bulb. I don't know why I had you just repeat that. All right? All right, so we're going to just turn this on. Okay, now this... Now, some of you over here, you can kind of see, kind of not, all right? But you can see kind of like the, the periphery of it, okay? This symbolizes the light of Christ. Now, don't miss it. The light of Christ, the light is a person, right? It's a person. And so what often happens uh, when we're sleepy spiritually uh, when we're often distracted and deterred by, well, the light of Christ, which is, by the way, always shining, always shining. And, uh, and, and so when what happens is, is there's the light. That, that represents Christ. That is Christ, the light, shining. And if we were to literally try and make this place completely dark, and we had that light on or those lights on, I mean, truly, that's where our attention would be drawn, right? This is the power of the light in darkness. And so whenever you see the light of Christ, when you fixate and it draws your attention, you may be over here, but this light right here representing Christ now, boom, I'm transfixed, I'm centered, I'm focused on the light, that's Christ. What happens to your spiritual blindness or also possibly your spiritual dimness, what happens is an awakening takes place. Sleepy, sleepy, sleepy Christ. An awakening happens, an alertness, Christ. And then what happens is that when you walk towards the light, there's an awakening that first happens. You with me? Then there's an invitation. Come. And so I am now going towards the light so that I may live in the light. And the closer I get to the light, what happens? The light literally consumes you. It consumes you consumes your external, outside person. And as I, without fear, God, I, I want to come closer, but your holiness is leaving me awestruck and speechless, and you say, please come, and I say, I do not fear. I will come, and I will live and dwell in your light. Something amazing happens. Now, don't miss it. The light leads to intimacy. We're talking about perfect relationship with the living God, with Jesus, with the light. Something deeper takes place as you walk towards and dwell and live in the light. This is what takes place. It is intimacy and trust, and they grow and mature. And so many other things in the kingdom, like self-control, like, like patience, like love and compassion, and, and all the things in the kingdom that are the abundant life, that are beyond 
external and, and, and riches. It is the light of Christ, intimacy. I want more of you, Christ. I want more of you, Jesus. I will be consumed by you so that the darkness will not, in fact, consume me. I share this verse again, verse 21. Now, I've been fixated on that light over there, and it's hard to, for me to see my notes now. There's a, that, that'll preach. Verse 21. But those who do what is right, say right. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Intimacy advances kingdom impact. Intimacy, intimacy advances kingdom impact. Life takes on new meaning as opportunities to share Jesus with others, allowing the light of Christ to shine in dark places as we up, offer up our hands, our minds, our hearts, our bodies as living sacrifices for his ministry, for, the, for his kingdom and the expansion of his kingdom work. Who you are in Christ, the way of intimacy divinely cultivates kingdom impact with others. And so often we reverse that. We reverse it. And what, what gets sacrificed, unfortunately, in our giving. Now, now, God's called us to be servants. But don't miss it, church. It is intimacy that sustains you because it is the light of Christ. And oftentimes when I'm doing the work and I'm serving and and, and people don't receive your love, you know understand what I'm saying? It wears you out. And then you start questioning, well, I don't know if I'm called to that. I don't know if I should be doing that. And, and, and then the enemy just, well, finds vulnerability, starts getting in there. Yeah, see, like, right, just don't do it. Whatever it is, right? Whatever scenario that you may be experiencing even now. But let me tell you that the light leads to intimacy. That never runs dry. The light of Christ never grows dim. I know I'm preaching to somebody today. Intimacy leads or advances kingdom impact. John 8, 12, this is so good. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said this, I am the light of the world. If, say if, if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. God, the living God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has the words of life, abundant life. The second point I want to leave with us today is this, that the light impacts others. It's interesting that uh, Nicodemus, or Nikki, it's interesting that Nikki went to Jesus at night. Uh, and I, I do believe that it was because he was hungry for a deeper knowledge of the Lord. But listen, he was afraid of being seen, literally and figuratively. Literally, figuratively, and literally. It seems safer to remain in the shadows. And so let me ask her, if you feel compelled to answer this question out loud, I want you to consider this. What do you think kept Nicodemus from doing the right thing, to lean closer and deeper into the light? What do you think? What do you think kept him? Say again, fear of man. Yeah, that's a big one. I got to pray for that every day. Fear of exposure. Shame, status, yeah, w what if he goes all in with Messiah, the, the son of God? Say again, ostracized, fear of opinion, a, a new identity, a new person, a changed person, lots of fear. When you do the right thing in humility and come to the light of Christ in trust and 
repentance, which just simply means turn from your sin. Come back towards and to the light. You discover perfect relationship with Christ. And from there, the light of Christ impacts. It literally radiates. It explodes out of you to those around you. Intimacy leads to impact. Now, it's interesting. I do think that it's interesting that Nicodemus' curiosity caused him to investigate this Jesus of Nazareth primarily because he was doing signs and wonders. He was doing miracles. Okay, this, th- this guy's... D- He's raising people from the dead. He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons. There's something different about him. And in his intelligence and logic and educated brain, he determines this guy's different. And and so his curiosity got the best of him in many ways. But what Jesus was literally showing him and telling him that, that Nikki, the light is a person. God is in front of you. But he didn't guess it, get it. He, it went over his head. That I am the Christ, I am Messiah. Now, it, this, is, this, this quote is good. It comes from Acts chapter 26. And uh, go ahead and put that up there, Connor. Uh, 26, 17 to 18. I am sending you to open their eyes so that may, they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. I think that this is ultimately what was going on. This was the battle. Now, the word darkness appears over 165 times in the Bible. Darkness symbolizes sin, ignorance, and separation from God. This world is often described as the kingdom of darkness ruled by the prince of darkness. It is good news that light always wins. You need to know this. Amen. There's got to be more more amens out there. Uh, It's good news that light always wins. John chapter 1 verse 5 says this, The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Never means never. The best news is that we do not need to fear the darkness. Look, our world is fearing so many things, and the spiritual implication of this is that the world is fearing what it gladly invites, which is darkness. And so fear is running around rampant, an epidemic of fear. Listen, church, you have been given the keys of the kingdom including the authority because of what Christ did on the cross, which we're going to celebrate that in a bit in in communion, that gives you authority in the name of Jesus to walk in faith and not fear. The darkness, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. I don't know what that accent was, by the way, that I just uh, read that. So the best news is that we don't need to fear this darkness. And also, we do not need to fear the dark devil because the light has already won. Jesus Christ. Yes, that's worthy. There is no need to fear. Jesus already defeated darkness. And by the way, church, as Christ's representatives, which is the church, we have victory in Jesus' name. Now, I'll give you another, I don't know, poor illustration, but it's an illustration. So intimacy leads, or the light leads to intimacy. This is a headlamp. You need this in Wilton, by the way. So in my... What do you think? Matches my outfit. The light is Christ. And if we say that light leads to intimacy and then light impacts others, this is what 
happens. You're, you're out and about. <laughs> Some of you are like, wow, I need my sunglasses. Um, and, and so this is, this is you. Intimacy with Christ, consumed by the light, Holy Spirit light. And now from that, nice Ainsley, she's got her sunglasses, nice. And now you're out and about. And uh, I often get this, even with, you know, the, the caution that I have to throw the pastor card out there because suddenly conversation completely shifts when they find out I'm a pastor. It's like, oh, uh, I'm sorry for this and that. Like, no, 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 like, this isn't confession time. You can do that with the Holy Spirit, but, but let's just have a conversation. But oftentimes, you know, because the light is shining through you, because it's in you, you, you know, you just have that conversation. People are, like, talking like they're, I don't know, a sailor, and suddenly they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. You didn't even tell them where you stood with Christ. This is an example of a headlamp on your, on your head, the light of Christ. And the light impacts others. And I want to say this, that when you've been redeemed by the light of Christ, literally plucked out of the pit of darkness, you realize that it was the exposure of your own sin, your own rebellion, that brought you right into freedom and eternal life. It was your own sin that got exposed. And this freedom, this literally eternal life, this abundant life that you've been given, it's found in and through Christ. But at the same time, you realize that the light in you does expose sin in others. And so we walk around and we're like, I don't mean to offend you, sorry. Oh, um, yeah, um, God's important, but, but, you know. This is what happens. Listen, church, I want to empower you in Jesus' name. Do not hide your light. Intimacy in the secret place with your Savior, the relationship that you have with Christ, the world is going to say, Stop shining your light of God on me. I hate you for that. Don't give in to the lies and the accusations of the enemy. Is it hard to take me serious, by the way, with this headlamp on? Don't miss the point. This is not a time in a culture of darkness to hide our light. Don't be embarrassed. Don't apologize for the light that is in you. Listen, verse 20, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But Rob, I don't want people to hate me. Listen, I want to I tell you this. This is the truth. Jesus said this to you and I, the church. Don't fear man that would hate you. It hated me first. Thus, it hates you. Because man would rather prefer and live in darkness. You were once there. There's testimonies all over the place here. You were once in darkness, but now you're in light. And so as you're out and about and understanding that you're in this war, in all of the conversations and interactions as you bring the kingdom of God to wherever you go, do not hide the light. By the way, my father is going to be preaching next week, Matthew 5, in, in, around this topic of not hiding your light. Let me ask you this question. What is the, powerf- what is the most powerful entity, what's the most powerful force in the world right now? God. Everybody say God. Most powerful force, most powerful entity in the world, not just today, but forevermore. What is the second most powerful force in the world? Do you know? Sin. Sin. Read Romans 6, 7, and 8 today. And you'll get a feel, you'll get a sense of this second most powerful force 
called and is sin. Now, if I do just logic, the most powerful entity, the most powerful force is God. The second most powerful force is sin. It's no match. God wins. God is victorious. Thus, you as the church, Living Water Church, you win. Victorious. You live in freedom. You live in victory. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10 through 14, Paul says this, Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. There is no need to fear man. Uh, This is probably, for some of you, the first time that you'll ever hear the word Denzel Washington in a sermon, but he has an amazing quote, and it's this. Some people will never like you because your spirit irritates their demons. We show compassion to the person. We rebuke the spirit that's within them in Jesus' name. You understand that? That's important. Finally, the light rescues from darkness. We're going to enter quickly into the art gallery. And I want you to, this, is, this, this art piece is called Rescued from Darkness. Uh, tell me, what stands out to you in this art piece? A light? The ladder. What else? Say again. Escape. Ooh. That'll preach. What else? A way out. One step at a time. So good. Say again. Rising up. Rising up, yes. Contrast, the obvious contrast between darkness and light. I love when we can be in the art gallery together. The, the truth is this, is that there is always a way of escape because of what Jesus did on the cross. Free will choice, by the way, is a gift granted by God, and this proves that we are not programmed robots and that God provides the ladder from darkness into light. That's good news. That's worthy. God's worthy to be praised. He didn't leave us to our own demise. He didn't leave us in our darkness. You understand, he, he gave us a way of escape so that we may dwell and live in every aspect of our lives in the light of Christ. Verse 16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, will not be eternally separated from him, but instead have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Praise God. He is worthy to be praised. I hope that if there's nothing that you've heard today, that you will walk away changed because of the truth and reality of what Jesus has done and is doing and will continue to do through you and in you. On that crucial day at Calvary, while Jesus purchased the salvation of his believers on the cross, God brought a three-hour darkness over the land. Three hours. Satan thought he had the victory when Jesus gave up his spirit and died on that cruel cross, but instead the evil one experienced what was and is his greatest defeat, formed by the sovereign living God. Listen, Jesus is alive forevermore. He is alive. He is risen. Yes, Easter 24-7, 365. This is why and who we celebrate, we worship, we, ru- we worship the risen Christ. And right now, it may be for some of you, 
that the circumstances and the relationship, the, the severed and broken relationships, whatever is going on, it may feel like a death right now. Listen, I'm here to tell you that this too shall pass and that resurrection is coming because resurrection, the inheritance of true eternal life, this is not the end. We have victory in Jesus' name. And with that, I think it's appropriate that we celebrate and worship in communion. Worship team,